Hello and thank you for joining us for today's webinar where we're talking about the career aspirations of today's younger generation. The labour market is constantly changing and at the same time young people are staying in education longer than ever before. Uh, with all this rapid change students will need help understanding the world of work. But what jobs do teenagers see themselves doing in later life? And are they fully prepared to enter the modern labour market? In the latest round of the OECD's Programme for International Student Assessment, or PISA, we asked 15-year-olds about their aspirations for their future careers. And we then looked at how this has changed over time, as well as how this matches up with their academic potential. We put all the findings together in a book called Dream Jobs, Teenagers, Career Aspirations and the Future of Work, which you can find on the OECD Education and Skills website. So joining me today to talk about the findings is Andreas Schleicher, Director of the Education and Skills Directorate at the OECD, and Anthony Mann, an analyst for PISA here in the Directorate. Please feel free to send your questions at any time. You have two options. You can use the chat function in WebEx, or you can send an email to our edu email account, which is edu.contact at oecd.org. So the PowerPoint that Andreas is presenting will be made available online after the presentation. So Andreas, over to you. Yes, thank you. And I'm um, with uh, Anthony Mann here. They actually is the mastermind of the work that I'm going to go present to you. You know, when we launched results from OECD's latest PISA, everybody was looking at what students in the 79 participating countries know and what they can do. And of course, that's so important. But PISA also provides the world's largest data set on the dreams that 15 year olds have for their own future. Now we ask 600,000 students around the world about the jobs they expect to have when they are 30 and also how they actually learn about the world of work. So we can look at the career expectations of young people and how they have changed over time, but also how closely those aspirations match what we actually know about the future of work and how the dreams of young people can sometimes be distorted by social background or by gender. Now, you can wonder whether 15 year olds are at an age at which young people can possibly have an idea about their future. You know, the point is that some of the most important career decisions we don't make at the end of schooling when we talk about those things, but actually in the first years of schooling in primary school. It's the time when we figure out, you know, whether school is a meaningful experience, the time and energy we dedicate to learning, the fields of study where we place our greatest efforts, and all of that profoundly shapes the opportunities that we're going to have later in life. Also, age 15 is an age where role models and exposure to the world of work are hugely influential. If you never meet an engineer, why would you study hard in math and science early in life? It's very hard to be what you cannot see. And that's why the dreams and aspirations of young people don't just depend on students' talent. These are also shows that they're hugely influenced by the family context and people you happen to bump in. So let's have a look at some of the data on the context of this. First of all, we're going to talk about, you know, jobs that are going to be automated and whether young people aspire to them. And one thing that our data show is that there is a pretty robust correlation between the skill levels in a population. This is about the adult workforce and the risk of automation in the labor market. Highly skilled nations on balance are better protected against you know, job loss through digit digitalization than poorly skilled nations. So that's an important context that I want to highlight here, but let's get to the data. Is again, you know, every day teenagers make very important decisions about their future. Here you can see the uh, 15 most common uh, jobs that 15 year olds expect. Now in orange, I show you the expectations of girls and in blue for boys. So you can see doctors and teachers are the most common destinations of girls, no? the kind of jobs they see around themselves. For boys, it's more like you know, business managers, engineers, um, but basically, when you look at this more closely, you'll see that many of the dream jobs of 15 year olds are sort of 19th century, 20th century jobs, 
not 21st century jobs. Now, you don't find in this kind of picture, you know, the technician in the hospital who is going to help doctors or nurses to empower nurses to take on, you know, more responsibilities. You are not going to find, you know, the data scientist in this picture, all jobs that have a very important future. In fact, some of the jobs with the biggest growth potential are not visible to young people, maybe because they never have experience of this. It seems that what we know about the future of work doesn't find its way into the experience and aspirations of young people and its disadvantaged youths who are more likely to opt for jobs that are at a high risk of automation. I'm going to come back to this in a, in a, in a moment. Now. What you also see, I'm, I'm showing you here the data uh, for 2018 in dark and then the the diamonds show you where things, how things stood in the year 2000. You can see actually it's not been that much changed. Now, the world of work has dramatically changed over the last 20 years, but the aspirations of young people have been pretty static. In fact, you know, again, you can see, I mentioned already that disadvantaged young people are often more prone to opt for jobs that are more likely to disappear. Whereas students from privileged backgrounds seem to be a little bit better protected from those kinds of choices. There's also variation across countries. Uh, in fact, some of the high skilled nations like uh, Japan and uh, Germany still, you know, have young people opting for jobs that are at a both, you know, advantage, disadvantage that are more at risk of automation that has to do something with the structure of the labor market. But overall, it's the, the orange bars tend to be longer than the blue bars. So that should be of concern that we are not really reaching often those disadvantaged students and making good career choices. And I already mentioned, you know, the world has undergone major changes since 2000, but the career expectations have actually become more concentrated, and particularly among girls. You can see that, you know, 53% of girls opt for just 10 jobs when there are hundreds of jobs. For boys, concentration is a little bit less, uh, uh, less pronounced, but it's also accelerated over the years. So that's sort of puzzling in a way, maybe, you know, because the world of work is getting more confusing, that young people stick more closely to the things that they know do best. We do not know the answer, but I think that concentration is something that should give us to think. Uh, it varies by country. No, that's something also very, very important. If you look to Indonesia and Brazil, you know, everybody wants to become a doctor, a teacher, or a business person. Um, just three jobs, you know, dominate the dreams of girls in those countries. Uh, at the same time, you can see again, you know, Switzerland, Germany, Austria, countries that have a well established, you know, integration of the world of work and learning through their school systems, now preparing young people early on also for, you know, not just academic careers, but also, you know, other occupational pathways. You can see there, you know, young people seem to have a wider picture of the world, job concentration and the expectations seem to be a little bit less pronounced. So that's something, uh, it is also important that this concentration is not an aggregate phenomenon, but it's actually varying quite a bit across genders and country about this. Yeah, I you know, just to, I wanted to show a couple of examples. If you look to the United States, for example, you look at a computer user support specialist. It's a fantastic growth rate. You know, it's uh, more of these jobs. It's actually, the pay is quite okay and it's accessible. You don't need to study for long. You know, an associate degree is going to be enough. That's, you know, just two years of study after high school and so on. And um, sort of many of the prospects really good. The risk of automation is, you know, not that big, but it ranks only 229 in the choices of young people. Again, you know, we need to make the kind of jobs of the future more visible to young people. I think that's one of the conclusions that we drew from these kinds of data. Let me uh, continue. I uh, mentioned already, sometimes students do really well on the PISA test, they have excellent academic potential and still low aspirations, low expectations. In fact, across OECD countries, approximately one in three disadvantaged teenagers who did well on the PISA test do not expect to go on to tertiary education or work in a university level of education. You can see this data here. Huh? Basically, in blue, their propensity to complete tertiary education. 
um, or not to co complete uh, tertiary education, you can see very high among disadvantaged students, much lower among privileged students. And you look at, you know, I am a high performer, but I do not want to be a professional manager, sort of occupations with, you know, clear potential. You can see again a big gap across social classes. Uh, that is something. Uh, it's not, you know, that it's all about, you know, your grades at school. You can have actually great grades if you have a disadvantaged background. So you're much less likely to aim high than students from other backgrounds. This is also something that varies quite significantly across countries. Here you have the percentage of high performers who do not expect to complete higher education. And you can see across the board, the red dots seem to be higher than the green dots. So again, disadvantaged students in most countries, not much less likely to aspire to higher education, even if they have the same performance as their privileged peers. But there are exceptions to this. Uh, particularly uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, you can see countries where, you know, I made the dots in, in shading, which means the difference is uh, not statistically significant. So there's variability across countries, but the pattern is quite clear across countries. Same, you know, that was about educational expectation. You can see the same about occupational specific, uh, expectations. Here you have the share of students who do well on the PISA test but who do not expect to become professionals or managers. And again, in most countries, the red dot, the disadvantaged students are much more likely to not expect to be professionals, even if they do well, than their privileged peers. But you go to the right side of the chart and you find some, expect, uh, some uh, patterns that are different. Now that's a social background, gender, very similar phenomenon. Uh, think about this, here you have uh, high performing boys and girls, now, girls and boys who do great scores, who get great scores on the PISA math or science test. But now you see the boys want to become the engineers or science professionals, the girls at a much lower rate. Not everybody, but in most countries. Again, you can see some countries where the gap is very small, which shows that these are not, you know, innate kind of dispositions of boys and girls, but they must have something to do with the kind of experiences boys and girls have. And I say that may not just all be about schooling, you know, also the parental expectations, societal expectations, all of things uh, make a difference. But overall, it's something I think we should be uh, concerned about that, you know, gender and social background can distort the expectations of students with, which are great, uh, great performers at school. Um, the other side of the picture is true as well. You know, you may have teenagers who have very ambitious aims, but who are simply not ready for those in terms of their school performance. But what you can see is that one in five of the people assessed by PISA underestimate the levels of education that they need to secure the kind of professional and managerial occupation to which they aspire. Have a look at some of the data. You look at all students, you can see it's about 20% of the students who want to become professionals or managers, uh, but who are not say, who are saying they're not planning to complete tertiary education. So they are not aiming for the education they actually need to get the jobs they want. But the striking part of the picture is really again on the right side. You can see that likelihood is far greater for students from disadvantaged family backgrounds than those from privileged backgrounds having realistic expectations uh, about their educational, occupational careers. And again, you know, that kind of misalignment is something that varies across countries. It's not, you know, an innate feature. Uh, you have in some countries, you know, on the left side in Germany or Moldova or Hungary, Austria, that gap is quite large. Uh, basically, you have many students uh, who uh, want to become uh, professionals and managers, but are not going to aim for, you know, either a university degree or an advanced vocational education that would be necessary to do this. So I think that's very, very important. Now, we can do something about this. Effective career guidance, for example, can encourage students to reflect on who they are and who they want to become, and also to think more critically about the relationships between the educational choices in their future life. 
We also know that experience of the world of work can give young people the opportunity to apply their skills and knowledge in real situations with real problems. Now, the kind of problems that we often solve in school are very contrived, artificial. You know, at the end of the day, you know, people are going to throw into the bin what we have done. When people experience, you know, work situations in real life, they get a very different impression out of this. Uh, career guidance can also challenge students to understand what it means to be personally effective and also to be attractive to employers. Employers, you know, are going to give them real feedback and at the same time provide opportunities to, to develop social networks of value. Now, once again, you cannot be what you cannot see, sort of having contacts, having access to people working in different professions is something that is known to be very powerful in giving people dreams and aspirations. Also, when young people see people who do different jobs, they learn to see through gender and class-based stereotyping and broaden their aspirations. Now, that's one of the kind of images that comes quite clearly through this data, is that often students from you know, disadvantaged backgrounds, they may just know the job of their parents and their friends, and they may also be sort of pretty simple jobs, so they may not just have the horrors or to see the wealth of occupations that is accessible to them given their performance at school. So again, you know, seeing people at work in different situations helps you to cut through those kinds of stereotypes, whether it's gender or social background. And not, not least, also effective career development can help young people develop a better understanding of the relationship between education and employment. Now, what do I need to do in order to achieve my goals? Now, why should I invest you know, time and learning something at school that I may not understand intrinsically, but once I see a job where those kinds of skills are being used, I may come back to be even more ready. And even when workplace experience is limited, schools can replicate some of the positive benefits from first-hand exposure to the working world through, for example, career development programs at school. So PISA looked at student participation in career development, and here you can see some data. You can see the share of 15 year olds who have participated in career development activities. And again, I distinguish between disadvantaged and privileged students. No? You can see, you know, at first glance that again, students from privileged backgrounds, advantaged students are more likely to participate in career development activities. Students from disadvantaged backgrounds less likely to do so. Uh, and that's again, you know, those kids who need the most guidance actually get the least out of this. So it shows really when schools take this in their hands, they can make a difference to this. Uh, you can see, for example, when you rely on students to research from themselves the internet for information about careers, you know, advantaged students have an advantage. Now, probably because, you know, their families encourage them to do so, they have, you know, better access and things like this. I completed a questionnaire to find out about my interests and abilities. Also, that's something where things lie. I researched the internet for information about, you know, programs going beyond schooling. I spoke to a career advisor at my school. Suddenly, you see the social gap is disappearing. It shows you schools can create an environment where, you know, students, whether from wealthy or disadvantaged backgrounds, have access to similar resources. I went to an organization, organized tour in an uh, an institution, you know, providing services beyond schooling, you know, university or college or, you know, vocational education. I attended a job shadowing or work uh, site visit and so on. Those are the kind of career activities and you can see the prevalence varies. Uh, one thing that I don't show you here on this chart, which is, I think, a good news is that actually such career activities have increased in their prevalence a little bit, at least over the last 20 years. So clearly sort of there's more attention being paid to giving students real exposure. Um, and this is something I wanted to show you as well. You know, what we can see is that there's actually a positive relationship between participation in career development and having positive attitudes towards school. You can see, for example, students who did an internship, who attended a job shadowing, a work site visit, who visited a job fair, or who spoke to a career advisor at the school, are more likely to say that trying hard at school will help me get a good job. And hopefully they're going to invest greater energy, greater effort to learn at school, which is then going to be uh, what they need to get those kinds of jobs. Motivate, being motivated in school. 
again, you know, here you can see why disadvantage often plays so strongly into the learning outcomes because, you know, students from disadvantaged backgrounds, if they cannot, you know, see why they should learn things where they can't see the immediate value, may particularly benefit from those kinds of environments. Last but not least, I bring you back to the beginning of the presentation. You can see that the concentration of occupational expectations is much lower for students who've participated in certain types of career development activities. You can see, for example, I did an internship. Yeah. Students who participated in an internship uh, <clears throat> were much had a much broader view of occupational expectations than students who did not participate in an internship. Now, maybe the internships open up you know, new perspectives, new ideas. I spoke to a career advisor of uh, outside of my school. Also there you can see much more likely for students who participated, uh, <clears throat> uh, students who participated having a much wider uh, aspiration. It's not true for all of the dimensions you can see on the right side where you can see in some cases the pattern goes the other way around, but it's clearly something that we can see in many of those activities. We also don't, don't only know that career guidance can um, make a difference. Uh, there's a lot of research that actually shows how we can do that well. Uh, and when you actually look at uh, experimental and quasi-experimental studies that we find published in the English-speaking world between 96 and 2016, you know, that's the period that we looked at, most of the kind of uh, outcomes, whether economic, educational, or social, they're positive, uh, some are mixed, very little negative. So basically, career guidance in whatever shape or form uh, it's done now when followed up longitudinal seems to be leading to largely positive or at least mixed outcomes for the vast majority of students. Now, we also know how effective career guidance works. Yeah, it starts early in primary school and uh, it, it intensifies typically around key decision points. Now, when young people need to make choices between the programs that they study or the kind of school types that they want to aspire to. It connects classroom learning with future economic lives. That's also, you know, the point of it, bringing people basically in contact uh, with uh, possible occupations. It provides easy access to trustworthy labor market information from well-trained and impartial professionals. One of the things that we concluded often schools, including teachers are not so well positioned to provide explanations about new types of jobs because they have not experienced those kinds of jobs uh, themselves. Now, even, you know, often a career counseling is done by the school psychologists and those may not be able to provide that kind of linkage between the world of work and the world of learning in the way it's needed. Uh, career guidance that is well done also broadens the understanding of the labor market and uh, zooming in on occupations that are poorly understood and of strategic importance. Uh, not just showing you know, how the world of work looks today, but you know, pointing young people to opportunities that may be on the rise as well as we understood. It targets young people from disadvantaged backgrounds uh, for the greatest levels of intervention. And you can see here, that's where we bitterly fail at the moment. Most of the career guidance activities are more prevalent among students with a privileged background. And last but not least, it's experimental with rich and plentiful engagement from the world of work, now where students can actually do things, experience things, not just watch. Last but not least, let me mention that basically effective career guidance almost never works without the engagement of employers. Either by bringing young people you know, into the workplace, it's one way of doing it, or by bringing the workplace into schools, asking people in society or at the workplace actually to uh, meet with young people in schools and explain their jobs and get them motivated. Uh, employers can ensure that career expect experiences are authentic, and also uh, involve the first-hand encounters that make them authentic, that they help make career experiences relevant and valued by the young people themselves. They typically offer varied experiences that link to different outcomes for different types of students as well. They contextualize career guidance. Now, you can talk about a job, but then you see it, and you can see sort of how this actually works in practice. 
And also, you know, employers can do a lot to make career exp experiences really personalized. So that basically, you know, young people feel understood, they understand who they are, who they want to become, and can relate to this. That's all I wanted to share with you. There's a lot more data available in our report and, of course, in the entire uh, PISA study. And um, I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you, Andreas. Yeah, we have indeed received quite a few questions from participants today. So I'm just going to pick a few. Um, so this first one is about parents. Uh, someone has pointed out that parents are often considered as informal guidance but they have a critical role to play in, career, in the career development of their children. Uh, this person has asked, I would like to hear your thoughts and ideas on the parents' role and how to involve them in this process. Yeah, absolutely. Parents are hugely influential. First of all, that's the, uh, the first picture of the world of work that young people are going to get. Um, parents are also giving guidance to their children about, you know, the educational choices, the occupational choices they might want to make. But, you know, it's not about just about your own parents. I do think as society, we can draw much more effectively on parents, you know, around us. I give you an example. In the United Kingdom, there is a charity called Education and Employers, and they did something very simple. They just, you know, posted an advertisement uh, saying to people, you know, who is willing to donate two hours of their time per week to explain to young people their job. No? So these are not your parents, these are any parents, any person in the workplace. And basically, when they did that, you know, they got almost 60,000 people willing to actually share their experience with young people. And when those people go into schools, talk about their life, their job, young people are incredibly interested. So again, it's not just about, you know, relying on your own parents, but it's more about relying on society, getting the experience of societies uh, into schools. Now, schools tend to be very good in, you know, keeping students inside and the rest of the world outside. And the more we can break those silos and, you know, integrate the world of work and the world of learning through parents and through members of society, I think the better we're going to see young people aspiring for the right jobs. I'm also sat here with Anthony Mann. Anthony, do you have anything to add? Um, yes, uh, thanks, thanks, Henry. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, I, I think a couple of things here. One is that um, there's very good um, kind of longitudinal evidence to show that when young people have the opportunity to engage with a variety of people who, who have great experience and knowledge of different workplaces, that so they gain benefit from it. And um, we can see if we can track people from, you know, from birth all the way through their education into the into the workplace, we can see wage premiums emerging there. And the theory behind this is that, you know, people, you know, they, they don't know what they don't know. And young people have got often a very narrow, as we've seen here, um, it's got a very narrow sort of view about the, the labour market and what their role in it might be. And so when they do have the opportunity through their school, uh, uh, an institution which they kind of can know and trust, to explore and broaden their horizons by having the opportunity to engage with different people in different workplaces and different situations, uh, particularly sort of under the guidance of professional sort of career guidance, we see them sort of gaining something which they didn't have before. And what the new and different thing they gain is, you know, kind of trusted information, which allows them to um, think for themselves about whether they would be a good fit in different economic in different employment outcomes, different employment placements. And, and the thing about so like parents is that, you know, you know, I'm a parent, we're, we're, we're parents, we, 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 there's so much which we don't know. And if we're going to sort of try and provide advice and support for our children, one of the things which I think we should do is to try and really encourage them to be inquisitive and critical and thoughtful about about the breadth of the labour market and where they might might sit into it and this is actually what the Australian government did a year ago and they, they put out their um, national um, career strategy and it's, it's an approach which I think uh, uh, is, 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 is very very valuable because we want young people not to you know as we see in some of these the, the surveys where we have um, um, so many concentrated in, in their thinking in just a very small number of professions to be able to think beyond the doctor beyond the teacher beyond the engineer to think you know where they might fit um, really well in the labor market and what we think is happening is that when we see wage premiums later on where we see them earning more later on as a result of their participation in these sorts of career guidance activities is we think they're they're better fits for those roles and they've navigated an easier way into them and so when we see wage premiums we see somebody being rewarded for the extra productivity and for the um the better fit which comes from being that, that round peg at a round hole and one of the most effective ways you can do that is by sort of giving people that real world exposure at a young age. 
I'll move on to the next question. Uh, someone has asked, given the relevance you give to career guidance at school, do you think it could make sense to better conceptualize the learning outcomes in terms of career management or career development skills? Andreas, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that's actually a very important component. Often in school, we you know just frame academic outcomes. We're very clear on what the expectations for young people are, but those wider social outcomes are often not very well, very well conceptualized and certainly not integrated <coughs> into into expectations. I do think that education systems can do a lot to, and it's what I what I don't say is that we you know should narrow educational experience to fit the job market. This is not what this is about. It's really about widening the horizon of young people, giving them, you know, a wider range of, uh, of, of experiences so that they can actually, you know, then make the investments in the knowledge and skills that, that are necessary to have many choices uh, later in life. And I do think embedding that in, you know, uh, frameworks can be a great tool to help teachers understand the importance of it, have, help young people, you know, uh, dedicate the time and energy to this. And at the, at the end of it, uh, assess the results. Just to add there, um, I think there's kind of two two things you're pointing out. One is that this question is about career management skills, and that is something which, if we if we look historically about the way that schools need to help prepare young people for work, the this idea of career management becomes more and more important. We you know kind of know from. Uh, some of the work which we presented, you were presenting earlier, Andreas, uh, in terms of the, the risk of automation there is in the labour market, that some of those jobs which are, are, are the very greatest risk of automating are the ones which many school leavers and college leavers and university leaders currently do, because they're often semi-skilled, you know, the kind of low skill levels, and the easier it is, um, you know, the lower the skill level, the easier the automation. And that kind of like speaks to um, a, a kind of like a, a general concern for youth about how they can, can manage their transitions from school into, into good jobs in, in, in work, in that, you know, with automation sort of like coming through, we expect there to be you know, a need to have a, a great sense of agency in managing it. So we see it in the gig economy. Where young people need to, um, um, you know, kind of, you know, kind of manage their own careers to a much greater extent than perhaps we might have done a generation or two ago, and so I think there's something there which is, which is really important for schools to think about. This is, you know, it's not just about information. It's not. It, it, it goes beyond that. We need to address some of those unspoken attitudes and expectations, whether it could be very heavily gendered or related to um, kind of place or background, we need to address those. But also we need to think about equipping young people with the skills which they need in order to be able to navigate this, uh, you know, this, this more precarious uh, 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 economy than it's been in the past. And just so finally on this, one thing we think, well, what can schools do? One thing is that they can have a hard think about the extent to which they make some of these activities related to career guidance compulsory. You know, um, we kind of see that young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, you know, often you know, uh, missing out on some of these opportunities. Um, to some extent, that might well relate to um, not seeing the opportunity, not having the confidence to embrace the opportunity. And you know, if we start with a with a sense that you know the young people have a certain amount of information, this is a resource which they have, and it you know it's, it's information which needs to be useful and trustworthy for them. We kind of know that the more disadvantaged you are. The, the less you have of that from, um, you know, from your, your wide family and social background. And those for schools then, in a sort of a compulsory um, 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 guidance, compulsory can help um, sort of like address some of those, um, you know, sort of invisible, um, invisible barriers which people face. A yeah. uh, question here that's bringing it back to the students' own perceptions. Uh, is it unrealistic to expect 15 year olds to plan their careers now? That's a question that's come in. Uh, Andreas, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't think we should expect anyone in a young age to uh, plan a career. In fact, I think what we should encourage is openness to multiple careers to people. And um, so that's the one side of it. We should not and cannot expect 15 year olds to, you know, make choices uh, that determine where they're going to end up. And, you know, I had no idea when I was 15 year olds what I would be doing at, at age 30. But the other side of the coin is that people do make very important decisions. You know, early on in your school, you decide, you know, how serious are you going to take school? Uh, where are you going to place the greatest em emphasis? You know? Is that subject where, you know, put your energy just the subject where you like the teacher or does it have, you know, an intrinsic affiliation uh, with your own interests? And so this is, I think, the point to make that, you know, um, yes, you, you should be very open-minded about your future, but you should know, you know, 
studying science, for example, you should know what the work of a scientist look like. You know, studying history, you know, you should know something about uh, historical developments. Studying very practical subjects. How how is knowledge actually used and applied in a real world? I think. That's the point we're really making in this report, not to narrow, you know, student destinations in a specific, you know, pathways, you know, uh, the, the, the future of world, you know, is going to open up amazing opportunities for young people if they, you know, invest in the right, you know, attitudes, skills and knowledge and, uh, and values. And that's really the point of all of this, just, you know, to create greater awareness among students in school of how the real world looks today and how it might look in the future so that they can you know uh, ensure that they invest in the right things? Anything to add? For many young people, um, age 15 is very close to school leaving age or the end of compulsory education and the point where they need to make some very tough decisions. Um, and you know, I, I spent a lot of time over the years working on vocational education training. And in many countries, you know, that's a great example of something which is um, not an active choice for young people, something they fall into. Um, and it can be, and often is, something which has got you know, quite a bit of variability, but some really, you know, some, some really good opportunities there for young people. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's something which we see systematically young people not being uh, exposed to, not being able to make confident, informed decisions about. So 15 is kind of like a young age to think about how your working life is going to go, but it's not, it's not too young to think about the immediate decisions you need to make and as Dres says so rightly and so importantly, be able to, you know, where do I put my efforts? Now, um, how much do I really need my maths? How much is this language worth to me? You know, and these extremes of value, you know, is important. I think, and this this links to something else which we which we argue, which is that you know, this sort of um, engagement in the world of work should start at quite a young age. And some people, you know, would say, well, do you mean primary school at that age, at elementary school? And the answer is yes. And, and, and but at that point, it's not saying to a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old or ten-year-old, um, you know, what, you know, what's the job you actually really want to do, um, you know, and let's track you towards that. It's saying to the, those young people, well, actually, what you do in the classroom does have an ultimate importance to who you might become ultimately. You know, and I see it, you know, with my daughter who wants to be a professional dancer, and I tell her, you're going to need to do your own taxes. You know, you're going to do your own accounts, look after your own business, because you know, um, um, I, you know, I've, I've, you know, that, that, that's why that that business works. Um, but you know, she needs to hear that from you know people actually work in that profession. You can you know open their eyes to you know why what we learn in the classroom, how it's going to be important to us later on. And so we have some some really important decisions about immediate. Pre pre uh, futures where the courses and the programs of study that people choose have implications for what they can do after that and they can close doors as well as open them um, and as the as this you know there's this, this really interesting issue about kind of motivation and how we can harness things which can be really sort of you know quite 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 small interventions to make a difference you know um, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our in the PISA data here we've got you know kind of positive relationships being you're much more likely to agree that you know school is useful for later life if you've been to a jobs fair one hour out of your day, out of, out of a school year, if you've um, if you spent the time with a career counsellor. So these are quite these can be quite small interventions, but we're seeing some really interesting and meaningful uh, impacts which are picked up on the statistics. We're getting a lot of questions coming in both from the chat and the email. So if your question doesn't get read out, I do apologise. I will will be picking them, but we can't get through everything. So uh, we're going to move on to one here. It says, "How can you measure the actual impact of career guidance? Any suggestions?" Andreas. Well, I leave that to Anthony. He's actually spent quite a bit of work on using longitudinal studies to track that impact. There is some really, uh, I mean, there are some really interesting um, sort of data which um, which we can look at, which helps us to understand what we think um, uh, some of the career guidance initiatives that are making a difference. Um, I'll pick up a couple of examples. Um, one of the things which we uh, we spent some time on in this latest publication, Dream Jobs, is this question of misalignment. And, you know, so misalignment sounds rather grand, but what it really is, is when somebody, when a young person says that they um, expect to work in an occupation as an adult, but they don't anticipate getting enough education which you would need to be able to do that, that job, we see them as being negatively misaligned, by which I mean they're underestimating the amount of education which you need in order to be able to do, do the job that you're interested in. And if we, we, we think, well, OK, well, you know, that, that doesn't sound great, but what we find is that if you look at longitudinal studies, and these are, you know, the cohort studies which follow people from birth, you know, every five to ten years, you know, so we get lots of information about them, their background, 
which we can which we can we can use to um, put in place in a statistical sort of tools. Say what would we expect to happen to them? What do people like them? How much do the people like them earn? How much are people like them with the same qualification, same social background, likely to be in employment or out of employment? And if we look at the question of misalignment, there's there's longitudinal data sets in the US and the UK. Um, where we see here, and France as well, where we see, um, you know, um, significant um, impacts relating to the fact that you are misaligned. Firstly, we're going to see, as our study shows, it's much more likely to be people from disadvantaged backgrounds are misaligned, but they're doing worse in the labour market than we would expect them to. And what this suggests to me is that there is a, there's a real confusion, you know, amongst these young people, that their, their name and profession should then really understand. And, you know, we don't want to kind of rain in a parade and say that you can't do this, but we want you to understand what it takes to be able to do this, what the chances are, just how, you know, how well you need to do in, the, in education to be able to get to where you want to be. And so we can see also sort of like some really interesting relationships between things like um, uh, the extent to which you um, engage in career guidance um, discussions whilst at school, whether you go along to career talks, um, uh, how many of those you do. We see again relationships later on. We see relationships with, um, um, if you say you're uncertain at 60, in general, you do worse later on than we'd expect you to. And so we're in a position where, um, you know, over the last 10 years, we've seen the emergence of um, some really good scientific analytical data, which can help us to um, measure the effectiveness of the career guidance. And so we'd expect people who've had good effective career guidance to, you know, have um, informed understandings of how the education and what they could expect reasonably to get from that can relate to in a kind of different professional choices. And, and so within that, what we would, you know, what, what I think the, th the future sort of like work is to really sort of like, you know, harness what we know from this kind of scientific analytical approach and make that as available as possible to the guidance profession. Got a question here that's bringing uh, it back to the role of employers. Uh, someone has pointed out, I agree that employer engagement is definitely helpful with raising aspirations. How do you think we can generate more employer support? Andreas, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's one of the most sort of critical bottlenecks, clearly, that we find, you know, uh, internships are still rare, and if they exist, they're not often, you know, available to the students who need the most, the connections between schools and students and, and, and employers are not often sufficiently developed. I do think that's a, that's an area where employers should, and, th and that's, for example, also a reason why it's so much easier for older students to get access to internships than for, for younger uh, students to get experiences. So to the world of work. And, and I do think this is something where employers need to see they're not just making you know investment in their own company and their kind of future potential, but they make a very important investment in society. And uh, where countries have employers, where uh, education is not just you know an academic project or a government project, but a whole of society project, you suddenly see that career aspirations of young people are, are wider. You could see that in the chart that I show the concentration of career choices in countries where there is genuine employer engagement in school, where there are multiple career paths and, uh, and, and, and study choices for young people. You generally see that young people have a wider view of the world and that's good for everyone. Okay, so another question here that says, building on the Declaration on Investing in Career Guidance issued by the OECD and CEDIFOP and others in December, what would you consider as effective next steps uh, at European and international level? That's a good, uh, good question. No, I think the guidelines uh, provide a framework, and uh, the question is always, you know, how those frameworks get get implemented. And step one is creating awareness, and that's what this report is really about to create a, a better awareness. Uh, we also need to. Uh, have a better evidence base about what kind of you know guidance and 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 you know career exposure is most effective for what type of student and what age group sort of advancing the scientific evidence base and this is an area where the OECD wants to invest in the months and years to come to sort of establish use for example the PISA data to draw you know more value out of this and uh, but ultimately it comes to implementation it comes to you finding practical ways that show to you know individuals, schools, employers, parents that that is a good thing and a productive thing to do. And let me just add to that. Um, you know, I do think there's a real opportunity for 
really deepening our understanding about what's happening, particularly between countries. When we look at this PISA data, it's the first time that we've really dug into the PISA, the PISA questions around um, career expectations and the career thinking of young people. And, and when we do, um, we found that, you know, some really striking things. We, we find, you know, as, as Andreas has, has, has stressed, that, you know, disadvantage plays a really important role in determining who gets what. Um, we see that really significant gender differences. When we split out to these top 10 expectations by gender, we just see how concentrated they are between boys and girls. Um, we see as well that I mean, in many countries, there is, there, there, is, there is a really significant issue in terms of uh, poor understanding um, of the labor market. So if we look at across our data, we find particularly in um, developing countries, lower income countries, very sort of like high levels of concentration. Um, at one extreme, uh, we find in some countries more than 70% of boys and girls um, saying that they're interested in just a, a small number of jobs. You find heavy um, um, evidence of misalignment, heavy level of, um, of young people with the ability not expecting to sort of move into um, to higher education or even you can consider that. And so we have a real opportunity to look at some of the um, some of the other longitudinal data sets around the world. We can do some more work in connecting the PISA data set with the, um, the PIEC data set. Um, that's really interesting we can, because we can we can look at what happens to young people as they go into adulthood. There are some real opportunities as well then to share between countries um, what we know from the evidence to allow um, a really effective practice to be fully informed by what we confidently know. And I think there is a real opportunity there for this, um, this peer learning between countries. And this is what the this is one of the things which the OECD is really well placed to be able to do. I think we have time for one more question here. Uh, someone has been asking about the phrase repeated in the presentation, you cannot be what you cannot see. Uh, the question is, given your research, how is vocational education being addressed in career guidance education if exposure is not given early? And they have a follow-up, which is, is there any nation that has addressed this in a particular way that is making a significant difference? Andreas? Yeah, you know, vocational education and training is obviously one way to, uh, you know, incorporate career exposure, particularly when it includes a significant work-based uh, component. Uh, but it should be the only way, because uh, career guidance really should reach every child, every young person. Uh, every young person should be you know, aware of the kind of uh, choices that are out there. And, and I think that's, uh, that's the issue, really. Vocational education and training, particularly the work-based comp uh, component, is one, uh, one avenue to pursue this, but uh, certainly not the only one. I think there are many opportunities that young people should have to you know, experience. Uh, the world of work, whether they pursue academic or vocational programs, and there are may many ways in which employers should be, you know, included in discussions on, you know, the question of what young people should be learning and how they should be learning. The vocational education and training is a really interesting example um, uh, because young people, you know, often we often, we often see that young, you know, vet has got a uh, kind, of, kind of negative connotations. We see a lot of countries where, you know, vet. Um, it's being um, actively um, um, encouraged um, and rebuilt by governments and you know families are very very hesitant one of the things which we see in this piece of data is that you know aspirations are generally very very high you know in, in, across many countries you know the great majority of young people are saying they expect to go to university they expect to be professionals to managers and you know they're not really thinking about vocational education and training and I think the thing would be is that you know in many countries the decisions around whether you know vet might be a pathway or not are taken really quite late and it's about you know getting some information maybe in a few months before you come to a decision point and you know for this is you know with vocational education it's about it's about education and training which is linked to a particular occupational pathway and so if the question is you know do you want you know do you want to it's not it's not whether you want to uh, pursue a vet program it's you know are you interested in becoming the person um, to which that vet program is related the plumber the electrician the car mechanic the accountant you know we see it in, in different ways and that's where the um, you know that's where two things which come in which are really important one is that it's about addressing these often unspoken expectations and assumptions as much as you know providing information and we do this by exposing young people to you know to, to, to real world experience, real world examples of people who do those jobs, who can tell them what it's really like. You can actually run your own business when you're in your late twenties, perhaps. You know, this is what it's you know this is what it's like. This is what the opportunities are. This is where the technology or automation might make a change to the profession. And so we do that by making it 
easy for young people to um, to connect with um, people who can tell them straight, who they'll believe and find authentic insight into the professions to which these educational choices are really just pathways. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you, Andreas. I think uh, that's all we have time for, but I want to thank also all of our participants for your interest in this topic and in the OEC's work on education. Uh, a few people are asking where you'll find this presentation. Well, we will put um, a video of it up on our website, oecd.org forward slash education. It'll also be posted on our Twitter, which is eduskills, uh, uh, at OECD eduskills. Um, and yes, uh, so once again, uh, thank you to everyone for joining us uh, and until next time.